thinking about recent disasters and the things that have gone on in the world lately. It's kind of been a tumultuous time lately, hasn't it? And I think about some of the uh, videos and some of the pictures and some of the scenes that we've been seeing lately. And to me, a lot of that seems more like something out of Hollywood than reality. Some of the things that you see, and I'm thinking in Japan of the tsunami waves and some of those things, that sounds like it looks like more of special effects from Hollywood than the real thing. And then the explosions from the nuclear plants in Japan. Again, all of that kind of looks like special effects, but of course we know that tragically those are real images and real footage and the loss of life and the financial toll and all of those things truly is staggering. Unprecedented political upheaval in Middle Eastern countries, coupled along with the natural disasters like we've seen in Japan, the current worldwide climate of economic downturn and uncertainty have a lot of people wondering about these events and do they signal the end of the age? Do they signal an end time apocalypse? That's not just my thinking as I share those things with you because if you've picked up Newsweek magazine this week, this is what you find on the cover. Apocalypse Now. Tsunamis, nuclear meltdowns, revolutions, economies on the brink. What <clears throat> is next? <laughs> I guess there's a certain note of the way they've put that, asceticism and hardening of their hearts, I guess, in the wording of that. But obviously that's pretty pressing if that's the lead article in a leading magazine. I think that anybody that has specific answers to the question being posed about what is next, anybody that can tell you specifically what will happen next is certainly going to be in high demand on the uh, talk show television circuit, and I think they're going to draw large crowds. But we don't know the specifics, but we do know some very detailed information regarding what Jesus said about the end times and I thought this was a good day for us to focus on those things this morning. So Luke 21, hopefully you're turned there. But let's spend a few moments looking in Luke chapter 21. We're not going to read the whole thing, obviously. Great deal of material there. But I jump down to verse 7. And the disciples have questioned Jesus, saying, Teacher, when therefore will these things happen? And what will be the sign when these things are about to take place? The key thing in focus at the start here is the destruction of a temple in Jerusalem, which we know to have taken place in the year 70 A.D. And so that's kind of the main focus as we look here. But the statements that Jesus makes go well beyond the events back so very long ago. Because verse 9, he says, When you hear of wars and disturbances, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end does not follow immediately. So he goes from talking about the destruction of the temple in 70 AD to talking about the time of the end. And of course that is future yet for us. Verses 10 and 11, in two short verses, he summarizes and outlines the last 2,000 years. So if you want a quick snapshot of our history and our times, verses 10 and 11, he continued by saying to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes and in various places plagues and famines. And there will be terrors and great signs from heaven. So in those two verses, he has described again the last 2,000 years. And he says that they would be characterized by revolution, something we hear about nearly every day. Great earthquakes. I think that is an interesting phrase. Of course, we know there was a great 9.0 earthquake recently. And he talks about disease and famine and natural phenomenon. Those things would take place. Verses 12 to 19, again, we're not going to read all those, but I'd like you to just kind of look at those verses. In those verses, he describes the opposition and the persecution that his followers would face primarily his apostles, and I believe that describes well what his apostles faced. Verses 20 to 24 describe that which happened in the year 70 A.D., but also there's yet another fulfillment in the future, something that is yet to come, and so he describes some things that will take place there. But then verses 25 and 26, I especially want us to focus on those two verses. 
He said to them, the kings of the Gentiles, excuse me, I'm in the wrong chapter already. Let me back up a second here. Chapter 22 is not where I want to be, so let me back up here. Verses 25 and 26 in chapter 21. There will be signs in sun and moon and stars, and on the earth dismay among nations, in perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves, men fainting for fear of the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. So again, verses 25 and 26, he talks about those things just immediately preceding the return of Christ. There's some interesting phrases. There will be dismay among the nations. I wonder if that doesn't describe our times. How many of the nations are concerned about the economic climate? The countries of the world are all kind of intermingled today economically. And so I wonder if that's not a part of what is mentioned here, dismay among the nations. And some of the revolutions going on, concerned about the upheaval going on in the nations, again, as we see right now in the Middle East. And then a very interesting phrase, perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. There's a couple of meanings for that that might refer to the upheaval of humanity. Humanity is sometimes referred to as the sea. Revelation 13 talks about an antichrist rising up out of the sea, figuratively describing the peoples and the nations of the world. It can mean that, but perhaps in a literal sense, you think about the ocean, the waves, tsunamis. Again, I go back to the image of the great tsunami waves coming ashore in Japan and wondering if that might also describe it, perplexity at the roaring of the sea and the waves. And so, some very interesting descriptions. And again, as verse 26 pointed out, there will be fearful natural phenomenon that will take place in those days. Well, that's all kind of depressing, isn't it? Wow, preacher, I came to church today to hear all that bad news. Well, verses 27 and 28 are some pretty encouraging words, and we need to focus on these and be encouraged by these. Jesus says, then, referring to when these things happen, you will see the Son of Man coming on the cloud with power and great glory. But when you see these things begin to take place, I love this verse, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. There's the focus. A lot of people are fascinated by prophecy. And in time events, and it's kind of a morbid curiosity sometimes, it's good to know those things, but to be overly consumed about those things is not a good thing. The thing to be consumed with is what Jesus talks about here. When you see those things begin to happen, it's time to look up. It's time to be prepared for your redemption to draw near. The return of Christ is near, and resurrection and immortality is within sight for us. And so those are encouraging things. As I think about what we're looking at, as we look at what Jesus describes about the end times, and as we think about some rather fearful things to come into the world, I was drawn this morning to share with you, I think, a question and an issue that is much in the hearts and minds of us who think we might be living in the last days, and that is the issue and the question of what will happen to me during those days if I'm around? Isn't that kind of a concern we have? If we are the last generation, I pray and hope that we are, but yet on the other hand, I'm, I'm a little concerned. What's going to happen to the people of God in the last days if all these things are to be poured out within our lifetime? If you've ever read the book of Revelation, you know that about a fourth of mankind is killed off before the time of the end, and then a third of those that are left are also killed off. That's quite a lot of people that are going to die during those events, and so it's easy to read that and think about that and say, I wonder, God, will I survive the cut? You know, am I going to make it? Will I be part of that one-fourth and that one-third that gets killed off? Or am I going to be around? And, and if I know those things, and if I'm living in the last days, what should I do to improve my odds? You know, should I be stockpiling water and food and weapons? Should I think about moving to some other part of the world where they're not going to disturb me? What should I do? concerning those things. 
And believe me, as a pastor, over the years, I've often wondered about what my role should be as I stand before the people of God. Uh, is there some kind of preparations we should be making? Are there things that we should be doing? Are there things I should be warning you about and, and assisting you in preparing for? And I've often wondered about those things. Again, what is my role as a pastor? Just this past week in some of my readings, there were some things that converged that I think uh, was certainly of the Lord, and I think they have a bearing on our situation, and I just really feel it's important to share these things with you. I was reading this past week out of the book of Genesis, a familiar story about how God provided for his people through Joseph. You all remember the story, and how there was a forewarning given about a time of great famine, and how God miraculously provided for that uh, very difficult time for the people of God during that. I thought that story may have a bearing on our times. I also thought about the story of Queen Esther and how God directed the events to prevent people from undergoing genocide. I thought also in the book of Acts in chapter 11 how God raised up prophets to uh, indicate a coming worldwide famine. There we come back to the idea of famine again and how uh, God raised up prophets to indicate that was coming and for the church to be able to properly respond and prepare for that. I also thought about in the book of Exodus, how as God was preparing to bring his people out of Egypt, how he poured out plagues upon the Egyptians. And I was thinking about what an amazing thing about how God protected and provided for his people during those times. In fact, here's an interesting study sometime. If you look at the plagues that God poured out on Egypt during that time and look at the book of Revelation, you'll see there's a lot of similarity between those things. So I think there may be kind of a, a pattern and a lesson there. But as I was thinking about how God dealt with his people during that time in Egypt, there were great swarms of insects that came upon the Egyptians, and yet the people of God were spared. God brought a plague upon the livestock of the Egyptians, but the livestock of the people of God were spared during that time. There was a plague of hail. God's people were not harmed by that. There was a plague of darkness, and there was light with the people of God. There was ultimately the plague of killing the firstborn. And, of course, God gave instructions to spread blood over the doorposts of their houses, and they were spared from that. And so thinking about that, and all these other stories I just mentioned, there is precedent for God providing for and protecting his people in times of judgment. And I was encouraged by that. And I thought, you know, that is our confidence if we are living in the last days, that we ought not to be overly concerned about the plagues of Revelation or the disturbing things we read in Luke chapter 21. Yeah, those things are going to happen. They're going to come. But we have a God who cares for his people, a God who will protect and provide for us, and I think that should be our assurance. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I think it is presumptuous to believe that God will always spare his people from death because that is not the case. So we need to be realistic concerning that. How many martyrs have died for the faith over the ages? And we know that even all the apostles minus one died martyr deaths. Hebrews 11 talks about the people of God who died for their faith. And so we also realize that there's no promise given that we won't actually be killed for our faith if we live in the last days. But the very fact is, God has always preserved his people collectively, and I think we have that assurance that God will preserve his people even in the worst days that might come before the end. I'm reminded of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. The gates of Hades, or the grave, will not overpower it, referring to the church. And so Jesus essentially said there will not be a day when the last follower of Christ will be dead. And so his church triumphs. As a body of believers, it will go forward, it will be preserved, and we have that confidence, indeed, if we should live in the last days and those rather horrible things come about that we read about. So how do we live in the last days? If indeed we are in those days, I think 1 Thessalonians 5, I just want to read those verses because I think there is such a practical note to those verses, words from the Apostle Paul, 1 Thessalonians 5, the first 11 verses. And I think he specifically tells us, as we anticipate the return of Christ and the last days, how it is that we live. 
Paul writes and says, Now as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need of, anyone, of anything to be written to you, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath. I like this. This is an important verse. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him, therefore encourage one another and build up one another just as you also are doing. What does Paul say about living in the last days if indeed we live in the last days? He says, be alert, be aware, know the times that you live in. I think he says to us essentially, keep your wits amidst the insanity of the end times. Far be it that we should be given over to panic. We are the ones who are level-headed in those days. As he says, live according to faith, love, and hope. Those essentials exist always. We continually live according to those things no matter what the times. And he says to us in these verses, never lose sight of your ultimate destiny, which is salvation in the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ. Remember, the meek are going to inherit the earth. And nothing will threaten that or change that. Keep that in focus. That is our ultimate destiny. And so because of that, we pra 